if there's like one thing I could like write a letter to myself and teach myself one lesson from, give it to myself 20 years ago, this is what it would be. If there's one thing I could tell myself 20 years ago, it would be this about entrepreneurship. There are like four layers. If you're listening or watching this right now, write this down. There's four layers I see in starting a business or growing a business. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with a true legend of the real estate world, Mr. Brandon Turner. Now, for those of you who may be living under a rock, let me tell you a little bit about what, who Brandon is. Brandon is the host of the Biggest Pockets podcast, one of the biggest podcast platforms in the nation. He's also a best-selling author. He's all around, all around good bloke. He's the co-founder and co-founder and founder of Open Door Capital. He's a TikTok star and he's a social media influencer. <laughs> Um, and, but also, but ultimately he is a genuine dude and really down to earth. He actually even invited me to his home to have a drink, uh, when I was in Maui a couple of months ago, but I'm really pumped and excited to have him on the show today. G'day, Brandon. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Man, I am doing so good. I'm doing so good. It's always good to connect with you. I've never been called a bloke before, so I'm going <laughs> to go with, I think that's a good thing. I'm, uh, I'm excited to chat with you today. That is a good thing. And, and look, mate, I, I, I do want to uh, humbly say that, you know, it's great to have connected over the... Over the past couple of months, we have got to hang out a little bit at a few different events over the, the last little while. I know you've been traveling a lot. You're now back home in your home of, of Maui. But um, let's go back to the beginning, the, the, the pre-Brandon Turner, the pre-TikTok star and social media influencer. And trust me, guys, you need to see his dance moves on TikTok. Oh, it's, it's, it's so good. Freaking, it's freaking mm-hmm. awesome. But mate, rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. Yeah. So first dollar, man, uh, fifth grade. I didn't make, I didn't know anything about money. Didn't, didn't, my parents didn't like teach me about money. I didn't have any of the money, like lessons really growing up. So the first time I can ever remember making any money is my dad paid me $5 to haul like a huge pile of brush. We lived on like 10 acres of land. I don't know if you have acres out there in Australia, Mm -hmm. but okay. So 10 acres of land and he cleared a ton of it. And I had to like just haul like just massive, like 20 foot piles of brush from one spot to another. And then we ended up burning it. Uh, And I remember paying me, paying me $5. And that was such an uh, absurd amount of money. I mean, I was the richest kid on the planet uh, (laughs) for like 20 minutes until I spent that money, but it was a good time. So that was the first money I ever made. Following on from that, what what was your your upbringing like with money, and and, and walk us through the early brand and your know, childhood, going to school, going to uni. Did you get a did you get a day job? And you got sick of that and just decided to go start working with bigger pockets. I want to I want to know the, yeah. the pre the pre stardom type of lifestyle. Yeah. So in a nutshell, so I, I was raised a uh, good family. I mean, solid Midwest America family. My dad's a meat cutter or was until he just retired. My mom did daycare in the house. So we were very middle class, like blue collar family. The lessons about money was like, one, you don't talk, you don't talk about money. Uh, money is just more of an accident that some people just happen to get rich and some people happen to win the lottery and some people happen to be good at business. And it's just something that you're either born with or you're not. And they didn't say that, but that was kind of a feeling I already, I always had growing up. Furthermore, rich people are very much, I don't want to say look down on, but like look down on. I remember one of my buddies, his dad owned a plumbing company and I used to make fun of the fact, like to my buddy, I'd make fun of him, the fact that his family had a house cleaner. Because I, in my head, it was because they were lazy. They didn't want to clean their own house. They're too busy making money to clean their own house, right? And today, I've realized the opposite, that they didn't have a house cleaner because they were rich. They were rich because they had a house cleaner, right? And it's, such a, it's a subtle difference, but they understood the concept that not all tasks are created equal. They're not all the equal value. And so cleaning a house might be a $10 an hour task, but... I mean, this guy was a franchise, like he started franchising his plumbing business. That's million dollar an hour work. I mean, like he, he was very successful because he knew the, to work on those things. So anyway, I, I didn't realize that until much, much later. I was raised with rich people are, are bad in a way. Um, so I ended up doing the typical thing. I went to college, uh, uni as they call it. And well done. Thank you. And I got a degree in history. And literally the only reason I chose history, this tells a lot about my personality, is I had a conversation with the, whatever, the guidance counselor, whatever of the college when I was going in. And you see, I did a lot of like school, like college credits in high school. Then I went to like a community college. Then I went to a little tiny Christian college. And I went to all these little schools, right? And I was basically collecting credits just based on what I felt was interesting at the time. Uh, I had no real plan, right? So now I go to the final college that I'm going to go spend the last two years of my life to graduate from. And I'm meeting with the guidance counselor and I say, well, I've got all of these credits from different courses and different schools. What can I do with this? And she looked at it all and she was like, well, 
I mean, if you go with a history major, you'll get out of the college six months earlier. That's what I'm going to do. Like that was the only cho- like the only reason I chose history because I got out six months earlier because of how the credits transferred in and it was a less credit intensive major. I don't know. Anyway, so I became a history major, which can give you one of like three jobs in the world. Number one, you can become a history teacher. I'm, I'm going to go four jobs. One, history teacher, a librarian, homeless, <laughs> yeah, unemployed, <laughs> or a lawyer. That's really about it. Like you become the librarian, the history teacher, the, the lawyer, or unemployed. And so I was like, well, lawyers probably make the most amount of money there. And I, I would like to have some money as I get older. Um, let's do that. So I studied for the law school entrance exam, the test, the LSAT. Studied for a whole summer. I took the test. I did okay on it. Enough that maybe I could have scraped by into one of the top colleges. Maybe, but probably not. And then I read John Grisham's book, The Firm. Uh, do you remember that book, The Firm? They made a yes. movie with Tom Cruise, yes. right? And John Grisham has a way of just putting these subtle digs against lawyers constantly because he was a lawyer. So like, he'd be like, you know, like, yeah, that lawyer has been at the firm for 80 years and is on his fourth wife. Or that guy works 100 hours a week until he's 60 in order to become partner. And then he can work only 80 hours a week. You know, like, it's like he puts these like not so untrue cliches about being a lawyer. And I realized while reading that book, I'm like, that sounds like a miserable life. Like, like that's not me. So I'm, here I am applying and applying to school and I'm headed down that direction to go be a lawyer the rest of my life and realized I didn't want to do that. And at the same time, I bought a single family house, rented out the bedrooms and then sold it a year later. And I made 20 grand. And that convinced me that they're like, I, I don't even know if I would have made 20 grand coming out of law school. Right. Like, and I made that on a part time, just living in a house for free. Cause I rented the bedrooms out. And I decided then and there, like after I saw the property, I said, I'm going to go be a real estate investor instead. And that's how it started. Oh, wow. I did not know that you skipped uni altogether. Well, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> secondary uni, because I know in America here, you sort of have this preamble of going to school twice for some reason. Like yeah. in, in Australia, like I went straight into civil engineering school. Like it was like, oh, there, nice. there was no like, figure out what you want to do with your life and, yeah. you know, <laughs> come and spend a bunch of money and just do whatever, you know? Yeah, so that's, that's exactly that's- what it is. It's like, uh, yeah, it's just like, go, go do whatever you want for years. And then eventually you'll find out what you want to do and you'll be a hundred thousand dollars in debt. It's great. Right, right, right. So, so how was then the, the transition into the bigger pockets world? Was it a thing back then? I know you were early involved with the company. And for those, again, for those people who are listening, bigger pockets, everyone should know who it is. Go, go Google it. I don't need to tell you where, where to go, but w- what was that transition like getting sucked up in that world? Yeah. So it started with actually, so when I decided I was going to do real estate investing, I remember I called my parents and told them that. And I remember my dad saying something like kind of joking, like you don't want to get into real estate. Everyone loses, loses their shirt. This is 07, by the way. So like the market's like uh-huh. at its peak when I decided to get into it. And he's like, markets go down. He's like, your tenants aren't going to pay rent if the market changes and you're going to lose everything. And I was like, Oh, he's right. Like, he's right. I don't have any money. What am I a stupid 21 year old college grad, like just out of school making $9 an hour at some like group home. And I'm like, what was I thinking that I'm going to do this? So instead of giving up though, I went to Google and I typed in what to do when a tenant doesn't pay rent, what to do when tenants don't pay rent. And the site popped up this little tiny forum. It was just a forum at the time of people like asking questions called bigger pockets. And I was like, and I read this like answer. Well, somebody else asked the question, somebody gave an answer. And it was this incredible answer of like, well, here's the laws you can deal with. And here's the processes you go through. And here's how you do this. And here, here's how you rectify. And here's how you do cash for keys and all this stuff. And I was like, dang, there are answers to these negative questions. Like, cause everyone's got the negative why you shouldn't get in real estate. And then I realized that there are answers to every single one of them. And that's when I like sold my soul to bigger pockets. It's like, <laughs> I like this. I, I love this, this website. So I just started volunteering. Like, I mean, I, I, I would ask questions. I would answer questions. I would just, I was just a forum guy. I was engaged on the forums later on. As I built up my portfolio, I would ask a lot of questions about like, Hey, I'm thinking about buying this small apartment building. Like what's the best way to structure it? Like you can go back and look at my old portfolio post. Like I had no idea what I was doing, but I bought a bunch of units. Like you using bigger pockets as help. I ended up with like 30 rental units. I bought, a, a, I bought some duplexes and triplexes and then a little bit larger stuff. I ended up with 30, 35 units after when I was 27 and I had enough to quit my job. So I quit my job. Which and was I, like, what? I, I, at the time I had started working as a banker uh, and not like a banker in wall street. Like I was literally like the guy that the, at the bank and yeah, the teller and uh-huh. opens up checking I opened up checking accounts all day long. I was making 1275 an hour, I think maybe 13 wow. an hour. 
And uh, I quit that to go full-time, well, I guess basically to retire because I had enough money to pay my bills. Uh, it wasn't a ton. It was like $3,000, $4,000 a month, mm-hmm. but it was enough. And uh, right when I quit the job, I sat on the couch for a few months, got bored. And then Josh Dorkin, over the years, I got to know Josh as like a Facebook friend. Josh started Bigger Pockets, by the way. He was the only owner of it. He was the only employee. He had nobody. It was just Josh. And he was doing every, I mean, everything in that business. And so he put on his Facebook, Hey, I'm looking for some help editing blog posts. And I was like, I, I can, I can speak English. I can edit blog posts. It was a total lie. I'm, I don't know punctuation or English. Like, I don't know. I was a history guy, not an English major. So I can tell you all about world war II, but I couldn't tell you about the difference between there, there, and there. And so, so I lie my way into a contract position, pay by the post job, essentially, just like making like hundred bucks every post that I edited and published for him. So I'd read it, I'd edit it, I'd make it sound a little better. And then I'd put it out there on the, on the new, on the bigger pockets blog. And that's how it started. And uh, a little bit later, I, me and Josh were talking and we're like, Hey, what if we started a podcast? Mm. And then that turned into let's start a podcast. And then that turned into the podcast, which then became my full-time gig. I mean, I was just full on bigger pockets and I worked about a hundred hours a week for the next about four years. Just Josh and I together, just grinding it out, trying to build the company. And uh, yeah, that was the beginning. And 2007, how, how early in that was bigger pockets at, at that stage? It would be real early, right? It was real early. Yeah. So when I found bigger pockets in 2007, it had been around for a couple years. It was a small form. It had about maybe 7,000 total like members on the site. So then which I is, hung which out. Which is not bad. Like, which even, is not bad. Yeah. Like 7,000 like, emails is, is, is 7,000 emails. <laughs> that's 7,000 emails. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's not bad. Uh, and, and so Josh had, he had a thing going. I mean, he, there were several sites that were similar. They were all kind of competing for like, who's the real estate, like go-to website. And they were all the same size roughly. And then when I joined, and this is not because I joined, but when I joined, Bigger pockets took off so fast that it like there what there is no today there is no competition. I mean, there's nobody there is no other real estate community that's even close to as large as bigger pockets. And it wasn't a man, I'll say that it wasn't me. What it was was this concept that um, Gino Wickman explains in the book Traction and Rocket Fuel. And what Rocket Fuel this concept is that when a company has a company needs to grow fast, needs to have two primary roles at the top a integrator and a visionary. So a visionary sees where it wants to go and they've got the big picture, they got the vision, but they don't necessarily, that, that skill set to be able to cast a vision and be excited and to move everyone together, it's not the same skill set to sit down and do all the tasks. So a lot of companies get stuck because they are focused on trying to do both, the founder is doing both and they struggle. So Josh is the visionary and he brought in me and all of a sudden I was the integrator. I was the one running the podcast, like doing all the editing. I was editing the blog post. I was, I wrote a hundred articles that first year, like just long articles. I mean, I was doing all this, like the work that needed to get done. Now Josh was working as well, hundred hours a week, but it was like, on more of the bigger picture stuff. What happens when you get the right mix of a visionary and an integrator is the company just takes off like a rocket. Um, I found it in my own, like three years ago, I started a company called uh, ODC or Open Door Capital. We now call it just ODC. And I brought in right away because I knew that concept. I brought in an integrator right away. And then we went from zero to whatever, $300 million of assets under management now. And we're hoping to double that every year for the next few years. And so like, it, it's because I have an amazing integrator. Now I'm the visionary and I have an integrator. The next question I was always going to ask because knowing you now and coming across you more recently, you are the visionary. You are the guy that everyone goes to, the, the beard and, and, and the brand. But it's interesting that you started out being the, the, the integrator because- yeah. Did you know that you wanted to become a visionary back in the day? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because in, in the preface that with not everyone knows that, right? Yeah. You, you, I'm really good at integrating as well, but I also see myself going to a visionary role. Once you get, once you start digging into a business, you can start to see this could go somewhere cool because I'm fixing these issues on the back. So yeah, yeah. So here, here's my thoughts on the visionary, like. So I, like a lot of people, are just are good at doing things, right? Like you, you, you are, I'm, I'm sure as well. Like if somebody said, hey, I need you to go and write this post or I need you to go and analyze this r- real estate deal, like we can do those tasks because we're smart individuals that, that can just get things done. 
so all along I could do integrator stuff just like you could do integrator stuff, but it doesn't mean that's where I'm most aligned. So from the beginning, I have been most aligned whenever I can be visionary. And, and the way that I know that is because I never lasted in a single role at bigger pockets, like anything I did there, I never lasted more than a year. Like I would do stuff like edit the blog post, And then like, I just didn't like it. I didn't feel fulfilled. The only thing I lasted through was the podcast really. And that's because really I was, I was kind of the visionary of the podcast. Like, Josh like, would show up and record. And now when Josh left, David Green would show up and record. Like they were like the integrate. I mean, they were like the get the stuff done, but I was the one thinking of the vision of where are we headed. So I feel most aligned in that visionary role. And so every time I'm forced in, into an integrator role, that's why like I, I struggle personally and in, in, in my soul hurts whenever I'm in that role. Uh, and I, it took, 10, 12 years for me to be able to put into words why that is. I mean, I, and I didn't have the skill set. Being a visionary takes a certain skill set. It takes a certain confidence level. It takes a certain, like, how do I inspire people to work for me and to not leave me and to, to be aligned in the vision. And, and that takes a skill set that I did not have. And so I'm glad, like, I think I had to come through the bigger pockets world to realize that I'm the visionary. And it's partially why I'm, I'm like, you know, I just, I think you, you probably saw on Instagram. I just uh, stepped away from the podcast and bigger pockets entirely. I mean, I'm a part owner now, but the reason why is because like I have like, they don't need another visionary there. They've got, they've got private equity. They've got a CEO like Scott. We put Scott in charge when Josh left and, and like, they've got all that. They don't need another visionary. And so like, all I could really do is integrate and be the integrator, but I don't, I don't like the integrator. I don't feel, I don't feel great there. I don't feel aligned. And so I would rather be the visionary of open door capital, my, my company and do that. Cause I feel super aligned there. So I think it also comes back from being in the trenches. Everyone's got to be in the trenches, particularly as an entrepreneur, you have to learn every facet of the business in order to get to that point to say, yeah, this is not for me because yeah. In the beginning, and then, and I'm going to get to a point in a minute. In the beginning, you do everything right because you don't have the, the capital to afford someone to edit the podcast or to write the blog. It's, yeah. it's literally you have to do the soups nuts, and the letting go of the vine. Uh, if you know, also in the EOS traction book, talks about when you get to a certain stage, understanding who you are as a person and what you align with may have changed from when you started the business, and that's yeah. okay. And you'll change in the future as well. But it also, that self-realization is important for you as a leader because you can then say, I'm not good at this. And it takes a lot of courage to say, I'm not good at this because you've started the business doing everything. You yeah. could do everything. You, you think you can do it to the best of your ability. But in reality, there's probably some things you can't do that great. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, you, and you have to come to realization. And it sometimes is a little bit of a shocking realization. Like, yeah, I'm not that great at analyzing yours. Or I'm not that great at blog posting or whatever it might be to, 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 to move the business forward. So I think you've got to go through the hard times in order to get to that point to say, this is where I'm at. This is not where I'm at. I think it definitely, definitely, definitely helps to have gone through the stuff. Now, do I need to know how to change a toilet in order to hire a plumber? <laughs> Probably not, no. but I should know, I should know what a toilet is and how a toilet works. So I'm not going to get completely ripped off. Right? right. But if there's like one thing I could like write a letter to myself and teach myself one lesson from give it to myself 20 years ago, this is what it would be. And it, 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 it's, it's relates to any entrepreneurship at all, any, any layer of entrepreneurship or, or doesn't matter what business, doesn't matter whatever. If there's, if there's one thing I could tell myself 20 years ago, it would be this about entrepreneurship. There are like four layers. And if you're, if you're listening or watching this right now, write, write this down. There's four layers I see in, in starting a business or growing a business. The, the level one, I call the DIY level. So DIY means you are in there doing the work. When I got started in real estate, I was doing the work. I was changing the toilet. I was, I was you know, a answering the phones, placing the tenant, doing all that. Uh, I was doing everything because that's what, that's where my mindset was at is I get in there and do it. I also didn't have any money. So it made it like that was a lot easier. The next level up, I call the project manager level. That is where like you don't necessarily do the work, but you like hire someone close to you to do it and you kind of manage the project. So for example, I no longer change the toilet. I hire the plumber to come and change the toilet for me. Uh, and there's a, that's a cool level too. DIY is cool. It's fun. It, and some people love it. Project manager level of, of a business is great too. Uh, it's, it's fine. Level three, I call the COO level, a COO or chief operating officer. It's like the level where you build a 
team. Like you've got, you've got a couple of reports, direct reports underneath you. You've got a company like, you know, mission statement. You've got this business that is like a little engine that just works and you're in there and your job is to make sure the engine always works. So you're meeting with people, having one-on-one conversations with your team. So you're not necessarily even telling the guy, Hey, I got a call from Miss Johnson to fix the toilet. Cause you've got a, maybe a property manager or someone on your team who's getting that call, but you're making sure that team member is doing, you know, well compensated and you're encouraging them. That's where most business leaders get to at some point in their life. Now there's a fourth level that not everyone gets to and that I'm fascinated by. And I call that the architect level, the architect, almost like the architect of the matrix is kind of where I get that phrase. It's like (laughs) this person that oversees the whole thing and kind of designs it but it's not a part of it. It is separate from the beginning. And so, for example, when I started ODC, the the investment firm that I I have, like I was, I never analyzed the deals. I never even managed the team. What an architect does is they hire one person. An architect brings in one person, probably the COO, who then builds the team. And interesting enough, the COO generally hires the project manager level people and project managers tend to hire the the DIY levels or or the workers. Now, the interesting thing is, couple things. One, every, no level's wrong, right? Every level's fine. And there's people that are perfectly happy at each level. However, every level has a limit, has a limit of how high you can grow. Like you will not build a billion dollar real estate business at a DIY level. You can't do it. You just can't do everything in there. Yeah. You cannot flip a hundred houses a year. If you're the one doing all the construction, there's a limit to what you can do in any business being DIY. So every level has a limit at the same time the higher you go on those levels, the more risk it is and the more expensive it may be, right? Like you can't just be an architect and go and hire that one person and give them a good salary and then you'll build out a big team if you have no money. Now I've got good money right now. Therefore, when I built Open Door Capital, I just was like, like there's my team. I just hired everybody and I built it and I cast the vision and boom, it's done. Now the third thing is this. The third point about the, the levels is you can choose what level you want to start at. Now, most people naturally start at wherever they were. So I was a worker guy at like group homes and at that bank. And so I started at the same level. I started DIY, but I have a lot of friends who came from more of a project manager level. Jay Scott, great example. Jay Scott, book on flipping houses, author. Jay was actually literally a project manager for like Microsoft or some big company. So when he started flipping houses, it never occurred to him, Hey, go change a toilet yourself because that's not what a project manager does. So he started by hiring little contractors to do the work. So Jay started at project manager level. Now, other people I know, they were the COO or they were in charge of a business. They were an entrepreneur in another business or they were the boss at another company. So when they came into real estate, my buddy Tarl is an example. His first year, my buddy Tarl flipped like 70 houses. He immediately hired like four people and they just went and did that. And he's involved with every piece of it because that's where he came from. And then of course, some people like architect, like if I was today going to start a flooring business, like I would not lay flooring today, like DIY, I would not hire a random flooring guy and get him jobs and get him to go work, do the work. That's like the project manager. I wouldn't even like go and hire four people and manage those people. I would just hire one guy. Actually, what I would do is go buy a carpet company, right? That's what an architect <laughs> does. They go buy the carpet business or the flooring business. So anyway, that's the, that's the advice I would give myself is to just to know that there are different levels. You do not have to start a DIY, but it's definitely cheaper at that point. But if I can elevate quickly, and if I could have elevated quicklier, if that's a word, I would have. I would have. I love that. And, and, and just giving a bit of feedback, I started as a structural engineer. So I came in more project manager, COO level with my business. But yeah. I do think it's important going back to what they're going from an integrated to a visionary. There, come, there is a big step where you get to that COO. And a lot of people, or business owners, business owners, stop at COO, right? I'm at yes. that stage right now where yep. I stop. I, I have stopped. And the next step is exactly what you just said. I'm literally going through this, this conundrum right now. I was like, I'm coming into some money. Yep. What do other big businesses do? They reinvest in themselves. They can yeah. remove themselves. I actually got one, uh, I've got a word on my board here, replace myself in operations. It's going, go. to, take, it's going to take money, right? Like mm-hmm. instead of taking the money that I've worked over the last 10 years to put it into Reed Goosen's hoarding account and just cash flow and do nothing, I could take a part of that and do that, but the other part needs to go and say, okay, I need I need four tens or I need three kick-ass team players to go and replace me. And I love how you make you created those levels, but it takes a lot of guts to go from CEO it does. to go to architect because it takes investment and a lot of it. And yes. so I want to ask you now, because you've just come through it, how was that mental shift? Because yeah, because you, you're. You, you, I know you personally. I don't know what you've done. You, you're telling everyone, go out and get cash. We get these cash flowing assets, retire, retire, financial freedom, financial freedom, blah, blah. But 
you now have to take some of that and go and build out your team, which is a completely different from what yeah. Bigger Pockets talks about. It's 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 seven figure level type of manager yeah. that yeah. is is no BS anymore. This is getting into the big boy game, putting your big boy pants. So how was that? How was that transition for you? Yeah, man, that's a that's a great question. So when I when I looked at the beginning, first of all, I didn't build ever. I didn't. I didn't hire everyone at once, right? So I scaled it a little bit with new partnerships. Now there are ups and downs of that. So I gave away a lot of equity to a lot of people where I only own like roughly 40%, give or take right now of my real estate firm. I gave equity to a lot of my early people in exchange for having to pay them and for bringing in people that are like legit, like Brian Murray, who wrote the book, uh, Crushing It in Apartments and Commercial Real Estate. One of the best real estate investors I've ever met uh, we decided to partner together. So he has, he owns a large chunk of ODC and so does my buddy, Ryan Murdoch. And so does my integrator Walker. So I did that first of all, as a way to lessen the blow now, long term, that's going to cost me, mm. but is it because now everybody has incentive to grow it together? I do. I mean, our original goal was $50 million owned in three years. We actually just crossed three, well, we'll cross this week, $300 million in three years. So like, yeah, thanks. We, we was six X our goal. Would that have happened had I not had those people? Not a chance, mm. right? So the first thing is I gave away a decent amount of equity in exchange for, okay, to the right people. I also gave equity to the wrong people early on and I made some mistakes there and that that sucks. I'm, I'm paid for those for a long time and it cost me a lot of money, but you get through that stuff. I'm not bad people, just stuff like I gave away way too much to where I didn't have to. Uh, that said, that said, this was the logic I then I, I had. And this is where syndication is so freaking awesome because what we can do is let's say I, okay. So I started the idea go like start at the beginning going, if I needed to buy $50 million of real estate, what would I need? Well, I would need an integrator. Cause again, I want to be architects. So I would need, I need that COO. I need somebody to run the business. I would need an acquisitions person. I just does nothing but acquisitions. I would need an investor relations person. I would need a finance person. I would need a, I don't know what I'm missing there. Asset manager. Right. Asset manager. So I would Right. I would need like these five or six roles. So real estate's very clear cut. I mean, it's pretty clear what every real estate company needs. It's like these five, six, seven roles in the beginning uh, to be able to buy a bunch of big apartments and stuff. And so I asked myself, well, what would that, would co- what would that cost me? And at the end of the day, it was like, it was going to cost me about $500,000 uh, a year. Just, if you just paid for them without giving them. If I paid, effort. exactly. If I just paid salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I was like, well, what would I have to buy to generate acquisition fees, which, is, uh, you know, a fee when you buy a big apartment complex goes to keep the overhead, which is exactly what this is. So in other words, I worked backwards and set goals for my team based on paying salaries. So like whatever the salary amount that I, I like, basically I need to make half a million dollars. What does that look like in terms of assets to buy? Uh, and it ends up being like, I don't know, call it $30 million. If we buy mm-hmm. $30 million in a year of real estate, that will pay about a half a million dollars worth of salaries, you know, give or take, it depends on what you charge for acquisition fees and what your other overhead costs are. But, and so what, it, well, here's what it, here's what this does is yes, it is risky. This the thought of spending a half a million dollars a year on salaries feels like it's a lot of money you're going to lose. But in reality, as long as the company hits their goals, I don't pay anything. And so that's the truth. I have never actually spent any of my own money on employees from the beginning, because in the beginning, the first few months it was partners and, and bringing in those people. So it didn't cost me anything. Then we bought our first deal. Hey, we made, I don't know, it was like 30 grand in acquisition fees. That very first deal, that money went to hire the first employee that actually I had to pay a salary to. And then like three months later, we got another deal. Now we could pay like four more employees. And so like now we just have our goals. Now it's a lot higher than what salaries are, but it, it really, it pays for itself in real estate if you charge those fees. Now, not every company charges fees and that's perfectly fine. There's a million ways to skin that cat. But uh, my mentality always has been, I will make my money at the end. Mm. I want to be the last one of everybody, my employees, my investors, everybody. I will put all of my eggs in that real estate basket and I'm going to watch that basket very well and I'm going to be super rich if this works out well, right? But I don't need to make it now. I will sacrifice all my book royalties. I will sacrifice everything. I'll sacrifice all the fun things of having a private jet and all that cool stuff that rich people love to have because I want to put it all to the end and to make sure that it works. So anyway, that's kind of where my mentality is gone. So that's yeah. incredible because I, I just happen to be in this, this, the right, exactly the similar position right now of, of reinvesting and, and up leveling myself. And I think just personally, it sounds like going from that COO to architect is really, for me at least, it's unfulfilled potential. I, I'm driven by that to go, I'm 35, you know, I don't know how old you are, but you're like 
36. I, I need to take that next level. Yep. So that's what it was for me. It was yeah. this feeling that like I would go to conferences and everyone there was doing way more stuff than me, even though I was the guy on stage because I got a loud mouth. Right. And so they put me on stage, <laughs> but well, like, I'm like, I got four properties. Right? It was like stupid. Right. I just felt dumb. And so I was like, I have un what'd you say? Unrealized potential or whatever uh, the phrase unfulfilled, you just used. Unfulfilled potential. Yeah. That's what it is. But I felt that exactly there. I'll mm. tell you, here's, here's the best tip I have for people in your shoes. That's like, look, I am right now I'm running things. I'm in charge, but I want to get to the architect role. And this is the hardest thing in the world to do, but it's the thing you have to do. And that is hire the perfect integrator. Like when you hire that CEO that can take care of everything else, it's really that easy. Cause now, like, now like I hired Walker and by the way, Walker, my integrator started as an intern working for free. He then became a analyst for us. He then became an investor. I mean, not even an analyst, uh, became a, our lead, like lead underwriter, all unpaid. Finally, we offered him the job, uh, of like head of, uh, head of acquisitions, uh, after a year of him working for free. And then from there, we offered him a year later, often the job of COO. So from intern all the way up to running all of ODC right now, uh, and, 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 he, and yeah. that would be the same DIY that we just spoke about. He, he went from DIY. He went project. from DIY. Yep. Yeah. He went all the way up the steps. That's, that, that, that's incredible. Did. That's incredible. Um, one quick question before we, we move into the next topic is, sure. is your, your team, they, they, I know they're remote. How, how's that been managing that from yeah. Hawaii? Because I know that's where you live and it's a beautiful place, the place of the on earth where you are. Yeah. How, how has it been keeping the culture and keeping everyone rowing in the same direction? Yeah, man. Uh, so interesting enough, we kind of accidentally in a way developed a couple hubs. So I've got two, I think two official team members that live in Hawaii. Now, one of them actually moved here just because he was super cool. And we like, we didn't have to work together. I just was like, Hey, you want to come to Hawaii? And he's like, all right. Uh, and another guy, my finance manager I actually found, he actually lived here already. So two of my team members are here. We eat together all the time. Last night we're saying, Oh, and then Ryan, of course, who's on my kind of board of directors. He was like my first integrator. Uh, Ryan was a you know, co-founder. Anyway, Ryan lives here as well. He actually lives on the property. Same, like I have an extra, mm -hmm. like an ADU in my backyard. He lives there. Anyway, like last night we were hanging out on my lanai drinking until like, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night, just talking about real estate and life. And our families were all over and everyone's like having a great time. And that's what I wanted. First of all, I, I wanted that. So that helps with the culture here. But, but, Interesting enough, most people actually end up in Atlanta. Uh, like my integrator was in Atlanta. The guy who I moved out here to, to live in Hawaii, he actually is from Atlanta. Brian Murray, who's, you know, our asset manager and uh, a lot of stuff, just kind of like the smart guy on the team. He lives in Atlanta now. He moved there unrelated to everything else. So, and then the management team we then built in Atlanta because they were there. So I've got kind of these hubs. So all that to say is most of everything we do is digital. Even though like I live three miles from a couple of my guys and one of them is in my backyard, we still have most of our meetings on Zoom. So you, it wouldn't matter. How do we keep the culture going though? We are very uh, culture going and people excited and moving forward and rowing in the same direction. That is my job, right? That's the visionary's job. The visionary's job is the, so how do I line people up? Well, a couple of things. One, I cast a very clear vision of where we're headed and everybody knows it. I once heard Jack, um, Jack Welch. All right, so Jack Welch once, had, once said, that his job was to make sure that if he went to any one of his 100,000 employees and shook them awake at three in the morning and said, where is GE headed? They would be like, we're going here. And they would be able to name it. They would know exactly where they're headed. Mm -hmm. uh, that is my job at Open Door Capital. So I make sure everyone knows where we're headed and what their role is in that. Uh, mm -hmm. To do that, we, we operate very much on the EOS framework, which is uh, from the book Traction, right? So we have an EOS implementer. Uh, we, like, you know, we meet every quarterly quarter with them. We run the weekly meetings. We are strict EOS. Why? Because the whole point of EOS was to go from vision, like 10 year vision, down to a three year picture, down to a one year goal, down to a quarterly benchmark, down to a weekly action plan for every single person, every department and the company. And it all lines up in one line, right? So EOS has allowed us to do that, uh, which has been great. Secondly, I also, my job is a cast division, which is literally, I, I like, I mean, this is one piece of it. So for those who are, can't, are, are listening and not watching, you can't really see it, but this is a magazine cover that I made myself. It's called Open Door Capital Magazine. And on here is a bunch of our, uh, where we're headed uh, with the company. Everybody has this in their office. Mm. Uh, there's also another one I have. Uh, the, 
the idea is I'm going to actually create the magazine. I only got two pages done so far, but I'm going to write an article for each one. So for like, how do we get these returns and how, what's our core values and all those things that make the vision of what, what are we and why should we be excited about it is going to be in a magazine for everyone. So, and we communicate it regularly. We tell people what we're doing and we constantly up the Andy, uh, what the vision is. We allow people to help set their own goals that line up to the vision. So that way it's not just, it's not my goal for them. It's their goal to support my vision. And it just, it just works, uh, in a really phenomenal way. And then we get together regularly, at least once a year, if not twice, with that's the whole cool. team. So yeah, lots of stuff there. That's, that's incredible, man. And thank you for sharing. And I, I actually do love that idea of creating a magazine cover that it's like, a, it's essentially, it's a poster, right? It's, it's the same yeah. thing that it really outlines your goals and then creating a magazine out of that would be freaking awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be a subscriber. Oh, send me a free copy when, uh, when, when it comes out. My <laughs> oh, <well. friend>. um, <laughs> let's move into, for the last 15 minutes of the show, um, sure. your transition away from bigger pockets. I know we, we just yeah. uh, online, you just mentioned it. You know, I think I even gave a bit of a voicemail to say, congratulations. Tell me where that's come from, you know, mentally. You know, again, you probably went through a lot mm. Yeah, uh, a, a lot of angst probably with your family as well because you built a baby from scratch and you're now walking away from that baby. What, 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 where's, where's it going and why was the big impetus to to leave? Yeah, man, great question. So I, so first of all, I love bigger pockets with all my heart, soul. Like I love it. Uh, I, I'm a product of it. I'm the poster child of it, and I've built so much of it over the last few years. Uh, but it's also like watching your kid grow up. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, Josh Dorkin, who started it, you know, he left a few years ago. His, he, had a, he had a daughter who got really sick. Uh, and so he left when that happened. She's fine, by the way, now she's great. But uh, he left when that happened just suddenly. And so Josh came back and did an episode of the podcast. My final episode is I brought Josh back in and we were just talking about this process. And he made the, he made the analogy of it's like watching your baby grow up. And I said, for him, it's kind of like now watching your grandkid grow up. Like, like Josh, <laughs> Josh grew his baby to the point where it was like grown up. And then now I was like the kid and helped it grow to the next level. And now it's like, now it's a little grandbaby that's about to go off to college. Um, uni, as they say. Uni, yeah. uh, so, you know, it's, it's bittersweet, but here, here's the interesting mental thing that maybe a lot of people will resonate with them, but especially I think men, but maybe it's everybody, but I, I see it more often in men is we very much tie our identity to our work and to our business and to whatever it is. So like I, who am I? I am Brandon from bigger pockets. And so like me and bigger pockets were so entwined together and like melded together that it was hard to see where I ended and bigger pockets started. So I had a performance coach who asked me, I was just talking about being stressed out and having way too many hours working. And I wasn't watching my kids grow up. Like, I, I mean, we get into real estate so we can watch our kids grow up. That's what most of us do. We do it so we can do our hobbies. And I live in Hawaii and I never surf. And I live in Hawaii and I never take my kids to the beach because I'm always working. Uh, and I'm like, finally just realized like, this is stupid. And so my performance coach, he pushed the, he pushed the question to me, do you need to take like a one month sabbatical just to clear your head? And I don't take, I never took days off the podcast. I mean, I, I am the podcast for a decade. And so I don't miss an episode. That's part of my identity is I don't miss an episode. And as soon as I said, yes, I will take a month off. It was like part of my soul, like detached just a little bit like that. I just tore away from bigger pockets a quarter inch, but in that process, I kind of found a little bit of who I am without bigger pockets. Just, in, I mean, this is like an hour long of just thinking mm-hmm. of like, what if I left for a month? Could they survive without me? Of course they could. They don't need me. Like they, it's a solid company with lots of revenue streams. And then it was like, well, if I could go for a month, what if I went for three months? And I was like, yeah, I could do that. And if they go for three months, what if I just, what if I didn't, what if I didn't put a timeline on when I come back? I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'll come back and host a show again at some point, like on, on and off and I'll, I'll be around cause I love BP and I have, I'm a part owner now of the company, but yeah, it's, it's time to let them go. And the other reason why is this in a company, if you are like the one, if your company is dependent upon you to succeed and you get hit by a bus you don't, and your company dies, that's a major problem. Uh, Bigger Pockets is a company that's owned by uh, many, many groups and like, you know, private equity and, and Josh and me and, and Scott. But it would be very hard to someday sell that company or go public or whatever their plans are. I don't know, whatever their plans someday are, if Brandon Turner is the guy that makes it all run. Mm. So sometimes you have to like, I, we, and we all knew it from, from the last few years, we knew that someday the Brandon Turner Band-Aid would have to be ripped off and we have to see if it can swim or if it can, if it can float just fine. And I think 
it, it will definitely. I mean, they've already, they've already had now I've done a number of episodes without me. And those episodes are some of the best episodes we've ever put out. Uh, so it's hard for the ego to see your baby go and survive without you. And for me to be like, Oh, I guess maybe I wasn't that important, but it's the <laughs> best, but it's the best thing in the world for the company, which is to make sure it's not dependent on any one person. So for anybody out there with a business is, yeah, think who, it, who, if they got hit by a bus today in your business could tank the business and that's not a good thing. And so it, it's important to kind of find ways around that. It's really, honestly, this conversation is actually quite uh, well-timed. I don't know if it's kismet, woo, woo, whatever you want. I'm actually going through a pivot right now in my own company into something more, something bigger. And having that realization of talking about the steps, the COO to the architect, but also talking about the, the identity with a piece of something that you think that you mm. are. And yeah. then re- having the self-realization that actually the company needs to operate without you. And you, it's okay that you go in another direction, right? It's okay to let that go. And over the last couple of weeks, six months, I've actually had a lot of mental, you know, angst about it because it is what it is, you know, it's, it's your net worth, it's all these other things. Yeah. And it's not going away, but it's just like you got to go start something new and challenge yourself and unfulfilled potential and all the stuff we talk about. So I guess the bigger question is when's the month coming, mate? When's the family and the the wife when are you going away for a month? Uh, so we uh it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> we are going to attempt. So I'm taking, so I'm taking some time off right now where I'm refusing to do anything more. I mean, once January hits, I'm going to try to accept nothing, no podcast interviews, no, no, nothing for a good three months. I I think I'll go crazy, but I'm gonna try for a few months. The goal is to take a vacation. I mean, we we vacation a lot, but the goal is to take an extended vacation to Europe, depending on how COVID looks. Uh, Yeah. This coming spring, summer, either Europe or a uh, RV trip around the U S or both. But yeah, I want to take a good three, four, five months away and just travel. I'll hold you to it, mate. I don't want to see you. I don't want to see anything (laughs) on Instagram. You're done, uh, done, but that's freaking awesome, man. Look at the end of every show, we'd like to dive into the top five investing tips. Are you ready to get into it? Let's do it, man. Mate, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Yeah, I journal every single day. So and not every day. I, I, don't, I didn't do it this morning. Uh, I woke up a little too late because I was up too late. But I journal almost every day. In fact, I journal so much. So in the beginning, I went and bought every single like success-based journal I could find. I had Grant Cardone's, I had uh, Darren Hardy's, I had all these people's like daily success journals, like gold journals. And I'd use each one for like six months and they were all great. Every one of them I love because there's something you can pull out of each one. But finally I was like, I built my own. I actually like, I wrote my entire own, like what would be the perfect journal for me, Brandon Turner. And so I wrote it and then I went and printed it uh, with a book company. And then I had my own journal. I used that for like a year. And then I when we went and actually sold it. Now it's sold on Bigger Pockets or on Amazon. It's called the Intention Journal. So I literally, this was my journal that I use every morning. And I write down my top three goals. I write down why I want that goal. I write it every week. Every, well, I have a weekly and a daily, right? So every, every week I write it, every day I write it, what my goals are and what my most important next step is. So here's, here's what this is. If there's like one thing you remember from this episode, if we as humans simply define what our goal is, and then ask ourselves, what is the most important next step? M-I-N-S. Like, and then schedule it or do it. It's always like a five-minute task. Everything in life can be boiled down to a series of little like two, three, four, five-minute tasks. For example, okay, I want to buy my first apartment building. Okay, great. What's your most important next step? People are going to say, well, I need to find a deal. Mm, go, go deeper. What's your next most important very next step? Well, I need to, uh, I need to find a mortgage, I mean, a, a, a commercial deal, a broker. Okay, what's your most important next step to do that? Well, I guess I need to maybe go on LoopNet and look for properties in the area that are selling and look for who's, who's listing those properties. Oh, okay. So you're saying your entire future, your entire vision for where you want to head in life all comes down to a simple task of going to a website, going to LoopNet, and then searching for some properties. Yeah, that's all it is. So every morning I do that. I write down my goals and I write down what is my most important next step. You see, the reason we lack, the reason we fail to make progress on our goals is not because we lack the ability. It's that we haven't defined what the next step is. And if we just get into the habit of defining the next step, of knowing what you want, defining the next step, and then putting that on your calendar, you can literally accomplish anything. It's all possible if you just break it down to the next step. So I do that every morning. Love it. I love it. I have to get the intention journal by Brandon. Intention Uh, journal. 
by Brent. He's got your beard on it as well. Is that it, the- I, I, well, it's got beard hair. So when you open it up, the beard hair falls out. It's like, it's like <laughs> glitter. It's magical. It's, it's, it, you just don't know what body part it's come from, but it's, it's you don't know. It doesn't got, matter, man. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just a bit of the, just a bit of BT. That's all that matters. <laughs> that's all that matters. It's all, it's the magic. It's in the, the magic. Hair. Right. Question number two is uh, who's the most influential person in your career to date? Uh, you know, I'm going to say Josh Dorkin and here's why. So Josh Dorkin found a bigger pockets and Josh is, I always say this, he's the best entrepreneur I know, not because he's smart, even though he is, it's not because he's talented, which he is. Josh is the single most, the best in entrepreneur I've ever met because Josh didn't give up. Josh is like the perfect example of like getting through what I call the trench. So in business, there's this point where you start a new business, right? You've been here, I've been here and you get very excited about it. It's like, oh, this is be amazing. And then reality sets in and the money's not there yet, but reality sets in of the hard work and the time. And I call that the trench. You just go through this crappy trench and very few make it out of that. Very few make it out of that where you're having to just grind for months, maybe even years of making almost no money. And everyone's like, you should just stop and get the job. Josh made it through the trench and very few people do. And I learned that from Josh is like Josh worked in his basement for 10 years, making no money before he brought me on. And because of that, Josh is one of the wealthiest people I know. And he'll, he'll always be because uh, he got to the trench. So that was a huge impact on me. That's awesome. Uh, and being persistent, and never giving up is so, never giving up. so important for all those people listening out there. You have to do put in the work. Uh, question number three is what's the most influential tool in your business? It could be a physical tool. You maybe already mentioned it, which was the, with the journal, or it could be a piece of software that you just can't run your business without. What is it? I would say EOS as a system uh, and a tool, sort of like this whole process of the entrepreneur operating system, EOS from the book Traction. Uh, I, when I implemented that, my workload at Open Door Capital went from like 20 hours a week down to like three. Like it just, it simplified everything. It made everybody line up and it made everyone run. And, and it gave uh, my team something they could hold on to. So I'd say that. The second thing I'd say on a, more, a little more personal side is Evernote. I use Evernote every day. Every time I have a thought, anything, I, I record in Evernote. I've got tens of thousands of notes in Evernote and I can search them anytime. So it's like the other day I was like, I couldn't find, I couldn't figure out a password for my wife's like Apple, Apple ID. And like, I was like, I wonder if I've ever put that in Evernote. I mean, I have like the password managers, but it wasn't working. And I was like, maybe I would have at some point put it in Evernote. So I type in like Heather's passwords. Boom. There it is. At some point five years ago, I wrote down her Apple ID and password into Evernote. And uh, I use it all the time. I'm looking at it right here. I got a list of things I'm doing today, including this conversation. It's in my Evernote. Awesome stuff, mate. Question number four is in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure in your career? What did you learn from that failure? I would say I, oh man, there's a few to choose from. I'll go with an easier one like, like on a smaller level. I flipped a house and lost 15 grand on it because I didn't realize that a 4,000 square foot house would cost four times as much as a thousand square foot house. <laughs> like I just never realized that. And so I ended up losing a bunch of money. And yeah, the second lesson from that is I sold it. So bought it for like 50, put a hundred grand into it, a little over a hundred and sold it for like 130 or something like that. Right. So I, I lost some money today. It's worth 300,000 minimum, maybe four. And that was like only 10 years ago. So the lesson learned there is I shouldn't have been flipping houses. I should have just been buying more rentals. <laughs> the long-term, long-term oh. owner is, is, is yes. never sell. And they always say that you always yeah. look in hindsight, but it's a lesson that you can look back on. So awesome there stuff, mate. Last question is, where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Yeah, I'm probably most active on Instagram, uh, Beardy Brandon. I've been intrigued by TikTok. It's a fascinating platform. But no, it, Beardy Brandon on Instagram, Beard with a Y, like Beardy Brandon. And that's where I'm most active. Awesome stuff, my friend. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to really come on the show and give us your all just to I'm going to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think that the, the sort of the food triangle of going from DIY to PM to COO to architect was really, really good visualization for a lot of people on the show to understand the steps that everyone goes through, every entrepreneur goes through in order to get to that next step. And then what you need to do to keep up leveling yourself. Uh, I think that's super important. And then thank you for being so honest and vulnerable about the transition out of bigger pockets. I know we, probably a lot of things have happened uh, mentally in and around that and the decision to come, but also ultimately coming to peace with it to know that you're leaving your baby and it's growing up and it's going to do just fine without you. So freaking awesome, dude. Did I leave anything out um, of that summary? 
I don't think so, man. I think that was uh, pretty good, man. You're awesome. a good host, man. You know awesome. what you're doing. You've done this before. This is I great. Think, I, I think, I, I think, I, I thank you so much. <laughs> I was going to give myself a, a plug, but I thank you so much. Well, <laughs> mate, enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch up very, very soon. Thanks, man. Well, there you have it, a cracking episode jam packed with some incredible advice from Brandon Turner. Remember, check him out on Instagram at Beardy Brandon. I want to thank you all again for taking some time out of your day to tune in to continue Financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. If you do like this show, give us a five-star review on iTunes and we're going to do it all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack.